Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about homeschooling in the times of the pandemic. I have here with me homeschool parent consultant, Jennifer Pearson, who started a business. As soon as the, this pandemic started, her business really kicked into gear, being a consultant for parents who want to have their children at home getting the best education that they can. And this story started way before the pandemic, but that now is the topic that is really hot. This is the topic that everybody wants to talk about. So I thought I would ask Jen how she got started with this business. What is it that she does? My name is Ina Coveney. I am the founder of the Global Phenomenon and the creator of the Be Found program. And I'm here to share this story with you because if you are thinking about starting a business, doing whatever it is, a thing that you love, I want you to know Jen did everything right this year. And I wanted to really tell everybody, yes, you can do this too. So I want to switch over to Jen. Hi, Jen. It's so nice to see you. Hi, Ina. Nice seeing you too. So um, I wanted to start with what is it that you do in your business? Who do you help? What do you do? I work with parents who want to give their children the best possible home education while also having fun doing it and really instilling a sense of curiosity and lifelong love of learning in their children. I love that so much because I, I, if I were the kind of person with the infinite patience that you probably have and that your clients have to teach their children. I feel like I would want them to have more of an entrepreneurial mindset. I would want them to have more self-motivation. I wouldn't want them to just be sitting at home just doing drills, right? Just filling out worksheets, right? Right. Well, you really don't need infinite patience to homeschool. That's one of the misconceptions. And I heard that so often when I first started homeschooling. Other parents would say, oh, if I only had the patience. And then I thought, well, I don't have infinite patience. How am I going to do this? But the fact of it is, it really isn't patience you need. It's a little bit of trust in the process and trust in yourself. So first of all, you have to believe that your children actually want what's best for themselves. And you have to trust that to a certain extent. So you shouldn't be constantly cracking the whip and forcing them to do worksheets and drills and things that they find incredibly boring because the fact of it is they won't really learn long term that way and they certainly won't learn to think for themselves. I want you to tell me more about this. I would love to know more about how you got into it. So I want you to put yourself back in, in where I am, right? I, I only got a tiny glimpse of homeschooling when the pandemic started. And I have been told, Ina, you were not homeschooling. You were just following the curriculum that you were given, which is completely different from homeschooling. It's not the same thing at all. So I will not even pretend to say that I have homeschooled at all ever. But I want you to pretend that you're in my shoes. I have two kids. I have my two-year-old. I have my eight-year-old. And you were an average person with average uh, average thoughts about what the school system was going to be like and what your life was going to be like and kids were going to go to school and then to college and then graduate and like all the things that average normal people think. So I want you to put yourself back there. Tell us what happened that made your thinking start to evolve into homeschooling being the best choice. Okay. And it's been quite a process. So I was exactly where you are you know, when I first started, I was teaching at a university. I was teaching developmental psychology. My husband was working full time. Our kids were in private school. This was what I'd always imagined. Like you said, they'll go to school, they'll go to college. This is life. You know, this is the way my life was. My husband's life was that way. But then, first of all, I was teaching developmental psychology and I was working on my PhD in education and social change. And those two things started changing my mind a little bit about education. So first of all, my students in college would come into class and they would just sit there and kind of look bored and they would take notes, but then they would say, so is this going to be on the test? And if I said, no, I'm just telling you this because I think it's interesting, they would just tune out. Like you could just see their eyes glaze over, they'd pick up their phones. And I thought, wow, I, I don't want that for my kids. I want them to be curious. I want them to be interested in learning, not for the sake of taking a test, but for learning and for life. I kind of wish and I had had you as a teacher back then because I was <laughs> totally that student. I'm like, I, this is a means to an end to me. So creative learning didn't come until later until I started to find my own motivations for wanting to learn something. And that's the key. You have to find those motivations and you have to help your children find their motivations. So it's not just a matter of teaching them because 
yes, it's important that children learn and it's vitally important that they be prepared for college and the world after college if they're, you know, or, or even some kids may not go to college, but be prepared for life. But to do that, they have to find their own motivation. It can't just be that they're preparing themselves for a test. So if you can help them to explore their interests and to be curious about what you're teaching. So don't just teach dry facts, but give it a hook, like come in with a mystery that they have to solve or something that's interesting about it and let them start to explore it on their own versus, okay, this is what we're going to learn today. And then you're going to take a test on it, or you're going to do a worksheet. I mean, nobody likes that, but so, let me go back just for yeah, a minute. So what okay. happened? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so I started seeing these things and then I was in this program in education and social change and we started talking about the education system and some of the problems with it and the fact that, you know, they have 30 to 60 kids they have to educate at a time and there's only so much customization you can do in those situations and I'm not faulting teachers by any means. They are absolutely heroes, but it's just a difficult system to work within and be able to inspire interest and curiosity in children. So then at all, to all of that, my children were still going to school. And then my daughter, I started seeing indications that she was starting to have that only for the test mindset, or she was losing her curiosity. And she would come home and just the things that used to interest her, like going out in the yard and finding bugs and looking them up and finding out what they were and learning all about them. She just wasn't doing that anymore. She was doing her homework and then she was just exhausted. And then one night, I knew she was working on telling time. This is on my website because it was just such a pivotal moment for me. But I knew she was working on telling time in school and I was trying to hurry her up. I'm like, hey, it's bedtime. Come on, we got to get a move on. I said, look at your clock. What time does it say it is? And I thought, oh, this will be great. I can tie in what she's learning in school. And she looked at it and she said, mom, the big hand's on the 10. And we have only learned o'clock and 30. And we're done with time in school. So I don't need to know that. And I was just like, whoa. I mean, I went downstairs and I told my husband, I was like, okay, this is a problem. Like she really thinks she only needs to know this for school. Like she doesn't realize that what she's learning, she's going to need for life. And I tried explaining that to her. But at the same time, I realized that we all have that mindset when we're in school to a great extent, because we get in that habit of, I need to learn it to pass the test and then I can forget it. I mean, how many times did you do that in high school or college or even before. I mean, I know I did. Yeah. And, and I got, I got really good at taking yeah. tests and at passing with great grades. And then I still don't remember any other thing. It's, it's almost like it gets stored in the background in the self, self, in the subconscious and it doesn't, it doesn't come out. Um, and it took me a really long time to actually start learning because I actually wanted to learn the material rather than just because somebody else was expecting me to know it by a certain date. Right. And the yeah. problem is it's not so much that it's stored in your subconscious. It may not be in there at all because the problem is to really learn something. It has to get into long-term memory. Right. And to do that, there's really only a few ways. This is my psychology background talking, but you can sit there and you can repeat something over and over to yourself, like a phone number or you know, something that's very rote that you can just memorize that way. That's one way to get something to go from short-term to long-term. The other way is to give it meaning and to really process it deeply, to think about how it relates to other things and to think about why it's important and just to really mull it over. And when you do that, things get stored long-term because they're hooked into all sorts of other things that you know. Yeah. And that's what we want for kids. We want them to be able to process what they're learning and think about how it relates to other things and, you know, really be interested in the material because that makes it easier for them to remember it long-term. And they're not just going to find some little device that they'll learn. Like mnemonic devices are great, but there are a lot of them that I'm sure I used in school and I have long since forgotten. Right. And then somebody will bring it up. I'm like, oh yeah, I think I kind of know what that stands for. And they're great for a test. You can remember it for a week or so and it's great, but I made up sentences, you know, use the first letter of various words to memorize so many things in school that I don't remember anymore. Yeah. And I just want my kids to actually learn what is important to learn and remember it, not memorize all sorts of rote facts that they're not going to remember later. 
So you go and you talk to your husband, and I'm going to venture to say that a lot of us have had this conversation with our spouse about our kids' education. I know that I have. I know that I, I was having a big issue with my son at, at school. They would have them sit, and they give them 20 minutes to pick any book they want and to sit down and read for 20 minutes. So this is a story. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. <laughs> uh, so... When the pandemic hit and we had to start enforcing those time frames, because in the school, when they give us the curriculum, this is what they're expected to do. They should have 20 minutes of reading time. I'm okay, easy. My son is reading at, you know, two levels more advanced than he's supposed to. Like, that's great. He's going to love reading. So like, just go and read. So I gave him the Harry Potter book. I thought he was going to fall in love with it. I thought it was going to be great. It was going to be his first chapter book. And I see that, you know, he's moving through it pretty quickly. Like I see the, the bookmark just moving forward like very <laughs> fast. And then I'm like, well, that's great. So we give him the second book and he finished it in a day. Hmm. Hmm. So I told him, I'm like, I know that you didn't read the book because you can't read that book in a day. Like even if you're a really, really fast reader, you can't read that book in a day. And he, he got mad, he got angry that I was challenging him, that I was calling him a liar, that he's like, no, of course I am, I am, I am. So I, I got very angry at this, like, why is he lying to me? What, what is happening here? So I took him out for a walk, like the next day, I took him out for a walk and I asked him, okay, he's eight years old. I'm like, okay, Greggy. I want, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be really, really honest with me. He's like, okay. I want you to just tell me the truth. It's like, okay. What happened with the book? And he said, I didn't read it. And I'm like, okay. So what was happening? What was happening was that there were, there were pictures in mm -hmm. the book with like little captions. He was just flipping to the next image and reading the caption and flipping to the next image and reading the caption just because he was told you have 20 minutes to read as much as possible. So fine. He's just going to pick up and, <laughs> and, and, and even like he would just like flip the pages, just skim through the book and not be able to tell me who Ron Weasley was. Right. So that's when I went to my husband. I'm like, that's not cool. I don't, I, he loves to read. I don't want to put a time frame on him. I don't want to tell him that he has to do it so many times. I just want him to enjoy reading. So we just let him pick whatever book he, he has, whatever book he wants. And just like, just let him read it. Just get the pressure off. So I'm sure we have all had conversations like this with our spouse. Like, I don't like how they're doing this. And I spoke to the teacher and she's like, whatever works, right? That's not <laughs> the intent, whatever works. Um, so we've all had that conversation. But still, 99% of us are not homeschooling. What was it for you that made you go, wow, I really don't like it that this is happening to saying, because you had a full life. It's not like you were <laughs> sitting around twiddling your thumbs, trying to figure out what other major life project to take on. So, right. so what happened? What, how did you go from that conversation to saying, I need to pull them from school and homeschool them myself? It was definitely a process. And I've looked back at my journal from that time because I started with just this little seed of an idea and then it kept growing. It was like I planted it and next thing it was, you know, sprouting and growing like crazy because so I, I at that point I, I had a concern, but it had mm -hmm. in no way turned into I should homeschool. Mm -hmm. It was a concern and I was thinking, mm, this isn't good. I'm not happy with the way she's you know, really taking to this education. I'm not saying all kids would have this issue, but she certainly had this issue where she wasn't really seeing learning as related to life. And that worried me. So I talked to my husband and we we're like, yeah, that's kind of a concern. We need to talk to her and make sure she understands how this relates to life. And I thought, okay, yeah, I need to do that, but I'm probably going to need to do that with everything she's learning. <laughs> so right. then it, was other things too. So they started occasionally sending home math homework, especially because it's not my daughter's favorite subject. Mm -hmm. And they would say, we would have a note on it said, she didn't understand this. Please work with her. And I would look at him like, Oh, this doesn't look too hard. So I'd sit down with my daughter and say, Hey, let's work on this together. And I would walk her through how to do the problem. And she would be like, okay. And she would just whip out the whole worksheet. No problem. And I said to her, I was like, well, why can you do this at home when you're not doing it at school? Because your teacher said you didn't understand it. And she said, well, either she would say one of two things. She would either say, my teacher didn't explain it that way, like the way I did, 
which was apparently more understandable to her, or she would say, I wasn't paying attention which I think was more of the issue. She mm-hmm. tends to be a daydreamer, like lots of kids are, mm-hmm. and it wasn't interesting. So she wasn't going to pay attention because it was, you know, I mean, I, I kind of felt like math was a little boring in school. I'm sure some people love it, but mm-hmm. I always found it a little hard to pay attention in math class too. So she was staring out the window thinking about unicorns or something instead of focusing on what the teacher was teaching. Yeah. But I started to realize that, okay, you're wasting hours of time just daydreaming in school. We can sit down for 15 minutes and you can do the same amount of work and actually understand it. So there's something here. So I kind of just, it was more frustration at first. And I started just mutter, muttering to myself, I should just homeschool. And then one day my husband kind of overheard me and he's like, maybe you should. So he kind of called my bluff. And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't have the patience. I couldn't do that. What was happening before we get to the patience? Because you are going to address this concern of mine about the infinite (laughs) patience. You will tell me more about that. Um, What were you doing? What was happening in life for you at that point? So a couple things. So first of all, I was still teaching at Bellarmine University. I was teaching, but I was an adjunct. So I got to basically make my schedule each semester. They were wonderful to me there. And I, I taught usually three classes, which is a full-time load. But since I wasn't full-time, I didn't have to do research and attend faculty meetings and things like that. But I was teaching three classes. And then I was working on my PhD, mostly because I love to learn. Mm -hmm. And I could go for free while teaching there. So, um, so I was like, well, why not? I'll get another degree. I I like education. So I was working on my PhD in education and social change and I was enjoying it, but there was this feeling that I was missing out on my children's lives too, Mm -hmm. because the PhD program was a weekend program. And then during the week I was teaching and my kids were in school and then going to after school care or daycare. And so and then on the weekends when they were you know, doing things like my daughter, I think was playing soccer and I missed her first game because I had class and I just started to feel like something was out of balance. Mm-hmm. And I'm also a trained life coach. And one of the parts of the training is all about balance in life and that feeling of knowing, you know, what is right in your life and when things are out of balance. And I kept having that nagging feeling that I was missing out on something really important. And, you know, your kids are only little once. And you can't get that back. And I thought, you know, I could come back and get my PhD later. And I can teach other people's kids later if I still want to. But right now is the only time I can spend focused time with my kids. So I started to reassess the balance in my life. And that was, you know, it was just such a combination of things. I feel like everything just fell into place to make it the right decision. So I started thinking about that. I started thinking about how we were unhappy with our education. And then my husband was like, well, after I said the part about not having patience, he said, just talk to some of our friends who homeschool. And I'm like, do we have friends who homeschool? And he's like, yeah, you know, this woman I work with, her husband's been staying home and homeschooling their kids. You should talk to him. And then I got to thinking and I was like, you know, I have another friend that I haven't talked to in years, but I'm pretty sure she's homeschooling her daughter. So I talked to both of them. And found out, first of all, that it wasn't quite as hard as I thought it might be. And maybe they didn't have infinite patience either. Mm -hmm. And then I also found out that, wow, you can travel more when you homeschool. And you can learn, you know, or your children can learn through experiences. Like you can bake cookies with your kids and teach them about fractions. And you can, you know, to learn about the states, you can actually go to those states. And I thought, wow, like this is an opportunity that's just too good to pass up. And so the more they talk to me and travel is my thing anyway, I love to travel. So they kind of got me when they said you could travel any time of year. And so I thought maybe we should try this. So we went into it thinking it was just for a year and we would reassess. And really we kind of do reassess at the end of every year, but I think we're at the point now where we know we're in it for the long haul and the kids are like, why would we go back to school? I don't, I don't think so. I'm going to ask you for, Just for a moment, pretend that your decision to homeschool wasn't something that took time and consideration and thought and interviewing other people. Pretend now that it is 2020 and the people who are listening to us are considering homeschooling because this is 
coming at them like a wall like it's the it seems like the only logical choice and they they didn't really have that allowance of making this be their their decision to take at the time that they wanted to take it it seems like they feel like they're being thrown in the deep end of the pool to sink or swim I, I would love to know what somebody like you who had the the advantage to really give it some careful thought, what what can you tell people who feel that way, who feel like this just came at me, I didn't really get to choose this in the way that I wanted to. I'd love to know what you would have to say to parents like that who are going through that right now. I would say, first of all, any decision is always harder when it's not your choice. So just acknowledge that. It's not going to feel good because no one wants something like that forced upon them. But I will say, you absolutely can do it. Like if you're in a position where you don't have to you know, have both you and your spouse working full-time out of the house and unable to handle childcare, if you've worked that part out, the homeschool part, you can do. It's not this insurmountable you know, mountain that it seems like. It's actually it's difficult, it's challenging, and our first year was probably the very hardest, but it's not impossible, and it, you are your children's first teacher. I mean, they learn to talk, they learn to walk, they learn probably even their ABCs and maybe a little reading from their parents, and so you can do this, and there are so many things out there, so many resources that can guide you. There are people like me who can help hold your hand and guide you along the way and make it easier. So it's not as impossible as you might think. And I think it might be, and I hate to say this because I know that whole situation is icky, but maybe even a blessing in disguise to a certain extent, because for us, there were, like I said, there were a number of things that went into the decision and it ended up feeling like, okay, this is the right thing for us and we're going to go for it, but maybe not forever. And so some people are being forced into it, but some of those people I found were kind of mulling it over beforehand anyway. So this pushed them over the edge, but maybe that's just the nudge they needed and they might find that they really love it. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions? And imagine a parent like that, a parent who's facing this decision right now. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about homeschooling that you want to dispel right now? <laughs> the first one is that it has to look like school. Mm-hmm. and that you're basically doing school at home. You're not. Homeschool, in some ways, is a misnomer because it's so different from school. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, home has to be your child's safe place. It has to be the place where they are not stressed, where they're not feeling like they're being you know, attacked in any way. I mean, they have to feel safe at home. So if you're constantly fighting over schoolwork, that's not going to work very well. Mm -hmm. So homeschooling is a little different, I think, than school in that, at least the way I do it and the way I advocate, it's not so much forcing kids to do things that they don't want to do, which all too often is what happens with regular education, partially because you have so many kids you're dealing with, you can't, you know, go through each one and make sure they like it and you're customizing it and making it fit them. But with homeschooling, you have the option to sit down with your children and say, so what really interests you? Like, what excites you? What are you curious about? And for older kids, you know, what do you want to do with your life? What are your goals? What contribution do you want to make to the world? And then walk them through, okay, well, if those are your goals, this is what you're going to need to do to get there. So what do you want to do? You know, how can we get started on this now? What can we do this year to really further that path for you? And for younger kids, like the age of your kids, it's, you know, find out what they're curious about. And then you can teach any subject through the lens of what they're interested in. So if they're interested in Minecraft, you can teach history through Minecraft because you can, you know, do a little history lesson and then have them go build something related to it in Minecraft. And, you know, to build it properly, they're going to have to research it more. So they're going to learn some research skills. Or, you know, you can teach them math using Minecraft because there's a lot of geometry. There's a lot of multiplication to figure out how many blocks, you know, this by this is how many blocks and figuring out if you're going to have enough. I mean, there's so many ways you can tie it into other subjects. And I mean, any interest really, Minecraft's one example, but really anything your child is interested in, you can use that to teach anything. 
I have this dream of teaching my son about YouTubers. So he tells you like, he tells everybody, oh, my mom is a YouTuber. That's my job description <laughs> when he talks about me. And uh, he, when you ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He's like, I want to, I want to be a YouTuber. I'm like, okay, I would love to teach an entire lesson of really understanding YouTube as a business platform. The people that he's watching, they're not 12-year-old kids. In fact, these people are 25 years old and married to each other. Like there are people that are very young looking that he looks up to on YouTube. I'm like, no, these are adults doing grown-up things and treating this as a business. This is how they do it. I mm -hmm. would love to have, you want to be a YouTuber? I'm going to teach you what it takes to be a YouTuber as a career and teach him so much more context than kids have right now when they go online and they don't really understand everything that they're looking at or why they're seeing that or why things are that way. I, I have that dream to teach him that. You're kind of so like inspiring it. me to do that. Do it. And in fact, if you want to teach some other kids, there's outschool.com. You could just make it a class and get paid for it. People would sign up to have their kids do that for sure. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. I, I can totally see that because my daughter also likes to dabble in YouTube and she's, she's really been talking about wanting to have her own YouTube channel and doing things like that. And I would love for her to see the business side of it and really understand the ins and outs of it. Yeah. I think that is so important, especially nowadays, because you, you don't know what you're looking at online now as an adult. Right. Now imagine being a kid and that being your representation of the world. So what's another misconception? that you need everybody to just get off their mind right now? Well, since you mentioned it earlier, it's that you have to have infinite patience. Because Talk to me. if you did, I couldn't do this. I mean, <laughs> I, I would say I have grown, and I don't know if it's in patience as much as knowing when to push, when not to push, and how to handle things better. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that is a mindset change. So let me just ask you, can you force your son to learn something? <laughs> no. No. I cannot. Can, right. So you can maybe force your child to do an assignment because they will complete something in order to be able to go play or to avoid some punishment or something. It will be World War III on the way there, but right. yes, technically it's possible. Not how right. I want to live my life, though. Exactly. And the fact of it is, yes, maybe they have done the assignment, but did they learn anything, which was really the point of the assignment? Probably not. Did you see my eyes roll really right. hard at that one? Yeah. <laughs> just like your example with the Harry Potter book, if you're just forcing them to read a book, their eyes may move over the page, but none of that may go into their head. Yeah. So I've learned over the years that I can't just force my kids to do things. It's my job to make it interesting. And I mean, it can't always be the most fascinating thing in the world. That's true. So interest can come from a couple different things. It can come either from their acknowledgement that, yes, I need to know this for my future life, which isn't as easy with little kids, but that's okay because you've got some time with them to get them caught up to everything they need to know. But with, you know, once they hit about 11 or 12, they start to have that insight into, yeah, math isn't my favorite, but I'm going to need this for college and I need college because I want to go, you know, become a vet or I want to go do whatever it is they want to do. So they start to think ahead a little bit and you can help them with that process. But when they're younger, you can make it interesting by tying it into things they're interested in. Or like when we teach history, I come at it from the angle of some sort of a mystery or some sort of a, um, like I give them a clue to something like some original document or something like that, or a story about something in history that is an, you know, kind of unsolved mystery. Like there's a lost colony at Roanoke um, that nobody really knows what happened, but telling the kids about it and then speculating with them, well, what do you think happened? And that can lead to all sorts of other things like, well, why were they there by themselves? Why couldn't they just call over to England and have them send more supplies? And then, well, they didn't have phones and a trip across the ocean. Oh, let's go look at the map and see how far it is across the ocean. And well, how long would that have taken if this is how fast they went? You can tie in some math there. And so all sorts of things you can kind of hook them in to, wow, all of a sudden you're learning. Yeah. So if you're not forcing them to do stuff, 
you don't need as much patience because you're not having to fight with them all the time. I think that patience is, people think you need patience because they think your child is always going to be resisting. Right. So if it's interesting and if they're getting to explore, you know, things they're curious about, you shouldn't need that much patience. Yeah. So the next thing is, what does a day look like if it's not school? Uh, because I remember, again, when the pandemic hit and I was there teaching the curriculum, I decided to inject, uh, this is something my son really loved, I decided to inject a little bit of what it, why is it that we are here at home? Why are we not at school? So every morning that I had to sit down and run through with him the activities for the day for his schoolwork, I would inject in there a pandemic update. And I would explain a little bit more about, okay, how many people have died so far? And how many people, how many cases do we have in the U.S. versus in other countries? And what is uh, the president saying right now? And how is that related to what we're living right now? And how long is, is it before we can get back to school? Well, we need to find out because of this. So I would do this whole chart. And he loved it because I, I am not the best artist at all, but I've always been able to just care for a lot of detail. So my little guys, whenever I draw a stick <laughs> figure, you know, he has eyebrows, right? Like, like it's just a very, very detailed little guys. And he <laughs> loved those pictures. So he liked to see something that he's learning from in little pictures. Um, so I loved doing that. And then I, I run into the block of, well, I can't be standing here teaching him all day long. And you just told me this is not supposed to look like school. So what does it look like? How should we reframe our brains as to what a homeschool a week would look like versus a school day. Okay. Well, it looks different for every family, first of all. And so some families, I do have a client right now, both she and her husband work full time mm -hmm. and she has been working full time the whole time she's homeschooled and she's been homeschooling her daughter since she was in about third grade. So it's possible. What that means is though, your child is going to have to do more independently or more online classes and things like that. And it may end up looking a little bit more like school in that respect. But there are other things you can do as well. So in our home, I mostly focus from you know, morning until about oh, one or two in the afternoon, my focus is on homeschooling. So what we do, we do a lot of sitting down together and reading. And my kids love that. And I try to pick things that are interesting and we sit down together and we read together and then we discuss. And it's not like it's a real, like, I'm going to read and then we'll stop and discuss. It's usually like I interrupt the reading to go, oh my gosh, did you hear that? And like, what do you think of this? Or they'll interrupt me with questions. And that's kind of how we do it. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that. And then we, we do more of a routine versus a schedule. So mm -hmm. next we'll do kind of the next thing. And sometimes I give the kids choice. I'm like, so what do you feel like doing next? Do you guys want to do, you know, some math or do you want to do some science? And I try, I mean, I've tried not breaking it out into subjects and a lot of them do cross over, but there's part of me that's just a very like organized once everything checked off. So I still, to a certain extent, do things in subjects. So we do still have kind of math time and my daughter does still do some worksheets and my son does an online math program because that's what works best for them. And that's what they like. I've given them choices. We've talked through ways to do it. And sometimes efficiency beats out being fascinating. And with math, they know they need to learn it. So they'll do it. Yeah. Um, but we do a lot of the reading together. And then we take a lot of field trips or we did before the pandemic. And I'm hoping to start doing that again. So we go to museums and zoos and things like that. But sometimes we just go out on a nature walk and we might take a microscope, like a pocket microscope, or we'll take a magnifying glass or something. And we'll try to look at things differently, not just your little walk in the woods. But really, I found it engages curiosity when you change the way you see things. So sometimes just having a device that lets you look at things differently can really make them more curious. So they look at a bug and they're like, oh my gosh, this bug has eight eyes or whatever it is. And, or, you know, I can really see this feature of it. And then they want to look that up and learn more about it and learn why that's the case. And so things like that can be great too. And we do a lot of that. I try not to just sit in the house and do school all day, every day. Right. Um, but the other thing I've been trying to build in is time for personal projects. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I'm still working on this with my nine-year-old. He's not like running out to like find something that's his personal interest just yet. 
too much. I mean, he mostly is interested in video games, but we're hoping that will evolve somewhat. Mm -hmm. But my daughter, who used to be mostly interested in video games, has now decided, and she came to me rather emphatically a couple weeks ago, and she said, Mom, I want to learn how to code in the Lua language so that I can write a Roblox game for my brother and his friend to play. That's great. So the first time she said it, I was like, oh, well, that's great. I love it that she wants to learn this. But I also know that sometimes she has come to me and said, I want to learn whatever and then lost interest. Mm -hmm. So I kind of looked into it and I wasn't finding a real clear, like, okay, this is how she should learn it. So I just sort of forgot. Mm -hmm. Bad mom, maybe not the best thing. But she came to me about another week later and said, mom, I really want to learn What happened with that? So I was like, all right, we're going to make it happen. I can tell you're committed. We're going to do it. So I ended up... um, signing her up for a couple online courses and she's since started like finding YouTube videos on how to do it and kind of teaching herself to a certain extent. But I try to make sure to always set aside time for that because that's her personal passion and interest. And now she's also learning um, a graphic design program called Blender because she has to make the graphics for the game. And she was telling me, she said, you know, I think maybe I'd like to go to art school or be a graphic designer someday. And So this is the kind of stuff that like when I was in school, I didn't get a chance to do this. I changed my major four times in college because I didn't know what I liked to do because nobody ever said, this is your time. Go enjoy it and do something that interests you. I didn't have personal project times. I think that's really important for kids. I I really like that. So there are parents out there who are listening to this right now and they're like, okay, I feel like I could do all of that, but oh, is there anybody else that can just like tell me exactly how to do this so that number one, I don't end up screwing up my child because we all have that internal dream as moms, just even in normal times, how much are we screwing up our kids? So (laughs) I don't want to screw up my kid. I don't want to screw up my relationship with my kid. And this is one that I I will say like my relationship with my son strained uh, when I was trying to follow a school curriculum and basically what we were just talking about, forcing him to do the work. It strained my relationship. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like, okay, I must need infinite patience then for this to work. So I feel like if I needed help. If I needed someone to know, you know what, to tell me, Ina, it's okay. There is a way to do this in a way that your children are going to be super happy in a way that you are not going to be stressed all the time. You're going to feel like things are moving forward. I want to work with someone who can help me get there. That's what you do in your business. So can you tell us a little bit of how you help parents go from frantic, I'm going to screw everything up and I don't know what I'm doing to, oh, this can be easy from day one. <laughs> right. I don't have to spend the next year just worrying myself sick and then having to go back to the school system anyway because I just couldn't make it work. This could just work on day one if I got the right help. I would love to know how you help your clients in going from A to B. Well, I really work with the parents and I help them, first of all, to have that mindset shift and to understand that homeschool is going to look different. And then we walk through exactly how it's going to look for them in their family. And to do that, I help them to get to know their children. And I know you're like, well, I already know my children. I mean, we all do, but to get to know your children as learners Mm -hmm. and get to know what it is that really excites them and makes them curious. And how can you then use that to teach them things and make them more curious about what you kind of know they need to learn. Because Mm -hmm. I mean, especially when kids are young, the parents are still the experts to a certain extent on what they need to learn. And we want to keep them on track to learn certain things, but they're the experts on what's going to make that interesting and Mm -hmm. what is going to really excite them. So I help the parents to get to know their children in that respect. Mm -hmm. And then we look at, well, okay, what resources can you use that will help you to then facilitate the learning and make your children curious learners and make them, I hate to say make them because that sounds like I'm forcing them, but like help them to become curious learners who are engaged and interested and excited to learn. And then that really will help to preserve your relationship because you're not this horrible person who's cracking the whip and forcing them. Instead, you're presenting them with a gift of something that's interesting and will make them curious. So 
it's just a very different mindset there. So I help parents to work through that and to, I really hold their hand and take them step by step. It was a process that took me years and I work with parents to go through that process in a few weeks. And yeah. I think it really saves a lot of heartache, a lot of fighting and probably a lot of money and wasted, you know, purchases because it's really easy when you don't know what you're doing to assume it's the curriculum or it's whatever resource you're using that's the problem. Yeah. And I see it all the time. I did it a million times myself and I'd be like, oh, this isn't working. I need to buy something else. Mm -hmm. And then you waste so much money on it. And so I try to, to help parents to avoid that because yeah. they just need to be confident in what they're doing and know it's the right thing. And you can't really just do that in a vacuum. You kind of need the reassurance and the guidance to know, okay, this is the right path. I love that so much. Just the ease of it. Just the, let, let's just do things right and take the right steps now rather than just going online and buying a whole bunch of curriculums and let's try them and see what's going to work next. So I love that so much. So thank you so much for talking to me about this, for talking to everybody who's listening about this. So how can they find you? How can they connect with you? They can find me through my website and it's confidentlyhomeschool.com all together, just confidentlyhomeschool.com. And that's probably the best way to contact me. I also have a uh, Facebook business page, same name, Confidently Homeschool, but I think it's Confidently Homeschool with Jen Pearson. And on my website, I have a gift for everyone who's listening. They can go to my website and download the seven most common mistakes that parents make when choosing a homeschool curriculum. And it covers some of the points I mentioned today, as well as many others that will be helpful to you as you're getting started. It was so nice to talk to you today, Jen. Thank you so much for giving us all of this information. And my name is Ina Coveney. You can find me at theglobalphenomenon.com and also in my Facebook group, The Global Phenomenon. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Ina. It was nice talking with you.